It's got the place where you can't tell the world from the church. Church goes to the bowling alleys, the bowling alleys go to church. Church goes to the hell holes, the hell holes go to church. Amen. Church goes out on dancing parties and the dancing parties come to church. You can't tell which one's the world and which one's the church. The church is weakened by sin. A lot of our churches have bridge plan. Cigarette sucking women in the church that claim to be children of God. Quiet in here. And a lot of our churches are not even good soup kitchens. All they do is have chicken and ice cream and tea parties. And let me tell you something, a church that has to serve chicken and ice cream and tea to get people out to church, they're as dead as a chicken, as cold as the ice cream, and as weak as a tea. I believe people ought to go to church because they love God, because they love to worship God. Sin has swept across this nation. It's swept into our homes. It's swept into our schools. And God help us, it's even swept into the church of the living God. And it's going to wreck God's church unless we get back on our knees and ask God to send a Holy Ghost revival that will stir men and women's hearts. We talk about civil defense. We talk about national defense. We talk about the A-bomb and the H-bomb being our security. But brother, there's nothing our security if the church of the living God doesn't get on her knees and pray for God to visit the people today. This country is going to be wrecked and ruined and the devil's going to take over. We need people with backbone that will stay on their faces and pray and seek God to visit his people with a revival that will open the eyes of the blind, cause the lame to leap for joy and the deaf to hear. How many believe I'm preaching the truth? Say amen. Fewer and fewer are the people that will preach this way. Fewer and fewer are the preachers that will preach out against your little pet sins. Your little pet faults. Some of our churches are so cold and so dead. They got snow in the pew, frost in the choir, and a six-foot icicle doing the preach. Those who need a warning from a faithful pastor, when he does preach out against their pet sins and their pet faults, it is long that you find that old boy packing his grip and hunting another place to preach. Why? Because people don't want what the Bible says today. They cry, do away with that bloody religion. Brother, I want the bloody religion. I believe the bloody religion is the Word of God. I believe it's God's Word. I believe He died on the tree and shed His blood that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Somebody said if divine healing is the Word of God, why don't all preachers preach divine healing? I'll tell you why they don't preach it for the same reason the religious leaders in Jesus' day didn't preach it. For the same reason, when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind and caused the lame to walk, they called him Beelzebub, the father of the deaf. Let me tell you, it wasn't the outside world that fought Jesus when he was here on earth, but it was church members. I said it was church members. And it was preachers, and it was priests, and it was other people that fought the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to remember another thing too. It wasn't the harlot and the drunkard and the liar that crucified my Lord, but it was a bunch of dead church members that nailed him to the tree. Now, I don't wish to cast any reflection on any preacher. 
But the reason preachers don't preach divine healing and the power of God today is for the same reason the religious leaders in Jesus' day didn't preach it. Let me tell you something. If you oppose divine healing, you don't oppose Jack Cole. You don't oppose a handful of Pentecostal preachers. If you oppose divine healing, you oppose the work of the living God who's healing scores of souls today, who's opening the eyes of the blind and causing the lame to walk and the deaf to hear. Brother, you're not opposing man, you're opposing God's work. I'd rather have my eyes put out. I'd rather have my arms cut off. I'd rather go through this life blind and lame and halt than I would to fight against the work of the living God. I'll never forget when I first got out of the army in 1945. I was down in a little old place called Red Oak Flat, Texas, holding a revival meeting. And it was in the country, and my whole congregation, that was back when I first started preaching, and my whole congregation, lots of nights, it only amounts to 12 and 13. And most of them would stand outside the door and talk about working in their gardens and planting crops. I said one night, I said, all of you fellows that are on the outside of this church, one of these times you're going to want me to pray for you. And I said, I'm going to do it, but I just want you to know you're going to want me to. And I'll never forget the next morning, about 8 o'clock, there was a knock on the parsonage door. And I went to the door and there stood Mr. Sloan. He walked out the edge of the porch and spit up blood and he come back. And he said, is Brother Paramore here? And I said, no, he's already gone. He said, Brother Cole, would you take me to Jacksonville to the hospital? That's Jacksonville, Texas. And I said, sure. I said, wait here till I get my hat and my keys to my car and I'll go. Somebody said, why didn't you pray for him? Because he didn't ask me to. I said, because he didn't ask me to. Bible didn't tell me to look you up. The Bible said for you to look me up. Bible said, call the elders of the church. How many believe that? Say amen. And I went in, I got my hat and my keys, come back out and got him in the car. We started to Jacksonville and he moaned and groaned and spit blood and I sit there and drove and sang I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way is going clear. Somebody said, my, you're hard hearted. Why didn't you pray for that man? Because he didn't ask me to. He knew what it took to get healed. Some woman said to me one time, said, I was sick and my pastor didn't come to see me. I said, did you call him? She said, certainly not. Said, he's a Holy Ghost man. He ought to know when I'm sick and when I'm not. I said, if your pastor knew all about you, you left town 24 hours ago. Aren't you glad God don't tell him? We got on to Jacksonville, and when I stopped the car, his wife got him out of the car and rushed him up the steps into the hospital, and I laid my head back against the seat and was meditating on the Lord and praying, and all of a sudden I heard a woman's voice saying, Come quick, Brother Cole, come quick. My husband's dying. His ulcers have bursted and said he's hemorrhaging today. He isn't right with God. I got out of the car and rushed up the steps and rushed into the hospital, and there was that old boy rolling from one side of the bed to the other, crying and spitting up blood and moaning and groaning. And I just went there and just sit by him and looked at him. Somebody said, why didn't you pray? Because he didn't ask me to pray. I just sit and looked at him. Hallelujah! Finally, he turned over and he saw me sitting there and he said, aren't you going to pray for me? I said, if you want me to, I will. Well, he said, I want you to. I still had on my army suit and I reached in and got my little bottle of olive oil out of my army shirt pocket and I anointed that old boy. He got one hand in the air and he began to say, Oh, God, forgive me for lying. God, forgive me for getting drunk. God, if you won't let me go to hell, Lord, I'll pay back everything I've ever stole. God, don't let me go to hell. God, save me, Lord. He was just a praying away and finally he began to say, Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I feel so good, God, I feel so good, God, thank you for forgiving me. He got kind of noisy. You get enough of the right thing, you're liable to get a little noisy. He got noisy. 
The door opened and the nurse came in and she said, looked at him and she went over to